All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to go ahead with part one of our two-part video series to finish up modern classification of living and non-living organisms. To start, uh, we are going to cover domain bacteria, then we will move into domain archaea, and then we will go into the largest of the domains, just because there are four kingdoms underneath of it, domain eukarya. One thing that is going to help you differentiate between these two is whether you are watching this video uh, on Monday or you're watching it later in the week, you should know the difference between a prokaryote and a eukaryote. These two domains right here are prokaryotes, and this domain, obviously given its name, is going to be a series of eukaryotes. So again, to break down modern classification systems into the three domains, you have these two, which are going to be prokaryotic, and this one, which will be a eukaryotic system of four kingdoms. So without further ado, we will go ahead and get started, and we will begin our study with domain bacteria. As you may have seen this slide in class, when I did touch on this just a little bit, bacteria, there are a couple examples of that, are going to be Lyme disease and also chlamydia. Lyme disease is, is, is a disease that is usually carried and given to not only livestock, but can be given to humans through ticks who have been infected with Lyme disease. Chlamydia is a sexually transmitted disease that also requires, because it is a bacteria, it is going to require antibiotics, right, an intervention from a doctor known as an antibiotic, to cure right, one organism, specifically human beings, from chlamydia. Some other examples that you may have heard of, you may be somewhat familiar with, are E. coli. Right? E. coli is something that uh, you consume right, through your obviously your digestive system, and it is most typically going to be occurred in occur into the human body through undercooked ground beef or undercooked steak. So again, E. coli typically comes from undercooked beef of some sort. So you may have heard over the course of you know, this age when you start to get to the point where maybe you're cooking a little bit, you may have heard your parents, grandma, grandpa, somebody in your family say, make sure the beef is cooked all the way through. Make sure my steak is cooked all the way through. Right? The reason they're telling you that is because of the risk of E. coli. Now, salmonella poisoning or salmonella bacteria in this case, right, there are an estimated 40,000 cases a year of salmonella. And salmonella usually comes from infected drinking water or infected fruits or other complex organisms in which humans eat. And it actually comes from animal feces. Yes, very disgusting. But you don't know that salmonella, in many cases, is present in drinking water and present on complex organisms that you are eating. So again, 40,000 cases a year and, again, would require some intervention from a doctor, typically an antibiotic, to rid the human body of these two bacterias. So what are some characteristics of domain bacteria? These are single-celled prokaryotes. At this point in your study, depending on when you're watching this video, you may or may not be familiar with what a prokaryote is. I ask that at some point you refer back to your science notebook because there is a, excuse me, a Venn diagram that will differentiate between a eukaryote and a prokaryote. It will help you with your understanding. I think at this point it's also safe to say we all know what a single-celled organism is. This is the largest group of all on the face of the planet simply because of many factors. The first is because they have extreme flexibility. They can survive on the human body, let's say the hands. They can survive on the tables here in the classroom. They can survive on the sinks, the urinals. They can survive on the chairs. They can survive on scissors, pens, pencils, right? They're also known, and one of the reasons that they're the largest organism on earth is because of the rapid growth in which they can actually go through and also rapid reproduction. So they are flexible. They're able to survive on many different surface types. They grow rapidly and they reproduce rapidly. 
So because of those factors, they are considered the largest group on Earth. I think there was an estimate done recently, I believe it was Friday in class, where I said there's an estimated 8 billion bacteria in your mouth at this very given moment. Right? That's more people. That's more than there are people on the face of the planet. So give that some perspective, hopefully, with that statement. Right, moving on to domain archaea. These, if you had heard me touch on these in class, these are going to be specialized types of bacteria. They're called archaea bacteria because they don't need oxygen to survive. They are also, just like bacteria, single-celled prokaryotes. They're very closely related to bacteria. However, the big difference is that they are going to be slightly different chemically. There is a cell wall structure that's going to provide some of the chemical difference. We will study cell walls here in class uh, over the course of this week and maybe even next week. So that should help with your perspective. Also, these particular types of bacteria are known for their ability to thrive in extreme environments. They've been found along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. They've been found in magma pools, lava flows, right? hot geysers, things like Old Faithful. Antarctic waters, where the water is so considerably cold, has so little thermal energy that in some cases, right, it has recently melted. And also places like the Great Salt Lake and the Dead Sea. Again, what makes these unique is that they're chemically different. They do not require oxygen. Here's a couple other fun facts to sort of file away, if you will. Methanobacteria, they live without oxygen. Methano is a, another way of saying methane. Well, how does a methanobacteria utilize methane? Or what process do they use in which you know, they require methane. Well, through the growth process, which we've studied growth and what it means to grow, whether you're a bacteria, a plant, an animal, these organisms actually produce methane as a waste product. So they require methane to survive, but they also go through a growth process and they produce methane as a waste product. In doing so, Humans, through the course of technology, have been able to use these methanobacteria as an alternative energy source. There are a couple dairy farms that I can think of, the mega dairies here in the county, that utilize this type of bacteria in order to produce a methane gas in which they can burn to create electricity. There is one just to the west of Haviland, about three to four miles, they have what is called a methane digester. Urine, feces from the cattle is placed into the digester. They introduce these methanobacteria. The methanobacteria go through a growth process, a reproductive process. As a waste product, methane is created. Methane, right, the same thing that you may find when you fart or you release flatulence, they are flammable. They burn the methane and then in turn are able to create electricity. So the use of methanobacteria, although at first wasn't something humans could use, we've now found ways to use it as an alternative energy source. Our third and final classification domain is going to be eukarya. Eukarya is, as you can see, going to consist of protista, fungi, planchaea, and animalia. I would venture to say most of you probably are familiar with portions of fungus or fungi. You're going to be familiar with planchaea because that's plants and animalia, which is animals. We'll start with the one that most people may maybe don't know a lot about, and that's protista. We'll give you an example of that. You have sea lettuce, right? As you can see, it is a green eukaryote. So if it's green in your head, that tells you right now that it should go through the process of photosynthesis. It should right, utilize chloroplast to produce a green chemical known as chlorophyll. Also, you have mushrooms. Those mushrooms are going to be part of the fungi kingdom. 
Yes, mushrooms, you can eat them on a pizza, but mushrooms also have a very important role in decomposition. You will typically find mushrooms in a forest or in a woods where there are going to be high levels of carbon. When a tree dies, falls over, decomposition occurs. That's how the carbon is returned back into the closed system known as the forest, and, in, and it returns into the soil. Mushrooms are a vital portion of that. You may also find in the uh, domain Eukarya, Planchea. Planchea is everything like a girl's best friend, not known as diamonds. Roses. You may also find oak trees. You may also find um, anything. Look outside. Grass. Right? It, it might be lettuce. It might be um, anything that you can see in your yard or in your backyard or in your neighbor's yard that's green is going to be part of Planchea. And last but certainly not least, animalia or animals. As you can see here, we have a picture of two dogs, one that looks very happy and one that looks slightly confused. And those are great examples of animals or animalia. Within the eukarya domain, these all have eukaryotic cells, hence why they are organized the way they are in the chart. They have a very different type of structure, cellularly speaking. They have a distinct nucleus, and if you recall, the nucleus does what inside of a cell? If you said to yourself, controls all functions within a complex cell, you are absolutely right. Eukarya also have membrane-bound organelles. If you don't remember what a membrane-bound organelle is, it's things like the mitochondria, the ribosomes, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, the rough endoplasmic reticulum. It's the nucleus itself. Essentially, in a very simplistic way, saying that a membrane-bound organelle exists is to say that the membrane-bound organelle has a platform in which it sits. It is called the cytoplasm. Here's a couple diagrams. I've blown them up. They're really difficult to read simply because they are blown out of proportion a little bit. But nonetheless, you can see the structure of both a plant cell and an animal cell. There's going to be things like the mitochondria, the ribosomes, the vacuoles. There's going to be a Golgi apparatus. There's going to be the nucleus, the rough ER, the smooth ER. You're going to have lysosomes. You're going to have ribosomes. A lot goes into plant cell and animal cell structure. We, when as we move forward throughout this week and also next week, we will center our attention on plant cell and or animal cell structure. We will also focus on protein usage. We will also talk about mitosis and meiosis. How do those work within plant cell structure? How about animal cell structure? This particular unit just continues to grow and expand. Right? So if you have questions, please see me during AAA. Please see me at the beginning of class. Ask questions where needed. I would be glad to help. If you have anything else, you're also welcome to email me. Have a wonderful rest of your day.